good and gracious God, we praise you and give you thanks that you are not a God who is silent in the course of history, nor are you a God that allows us to suffer on our own. But at the work of the cross, Lord, you have taught us that you are with us even in the most trickiest of all situations, and that you are with us when we suffer. God, fill your presence with this room. May we feel your love, and may we bring that love into the world. Amen. <clears throat> so today's passage is a tough one to preach about. Is that's also what I found myself thinking when I was writing the sermon this week, which came to a shock to me, because the story of the crucifixion is one of the most familiar stories in the life of the church. The church calendar has a whole season leading up to the crucifixion event. So the challenge that we have today is to understand it in a different way that is usually presented to us. I was tempted to get up here and say, Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins. Now receive this benediction, because that would have been so much easier than coming to grips with what it meant to live a cruciform lifestyle as it does today. But let's face it. We've all heard about the crucifixion. We've all heard sermons. We've all heard friends. Um, we've all heard sermons that make us fearful. And some sermons have treated the crucifixion as if God is working against Jesus Christ during the crucifixion. A contemporary understanding of this story always points to the forgiveness of sins or the idea that God is pouring wrath upon Jesus. Following that, there are some sermons that will preach about this story and say, if we do not believe in him, we will end up in hell. But for Mark, that is not the case. In the Gospel of Mark, we have a theme in which we see Jesus Christ continuing his work of God and for God on the cross. God is not working against Jesus but with him. The Gospel of Mark presents the crucifixion in a manner that we're not familiar with. There have been countless books written on Jesus Christ. For example, did you guys know that there are more books written about Jesus Christ than anyone else in the whole world? Followed by that, people write about Martin Luther following Jesus. For better or worse, the name of Christ comes out of our mouths, and depending on the street corner you're at in the city of Cincinnati, you will hear people preaching on the college campuses, or when you go to a Reds game outside of the stadium, you'll hear it being preached there as well. You see, it is everywhere we go, and yet we wonder why it does not spark the same kind of excitement it once did. None of it seems new to us. Like I said, the gospel of Jesus Christ is presented usually as the fact that we're sinners in the hand of an angry God, and that because of that, we are, um, Jesus Christ poured the wrath of God on him. Or, as I should, let me rephrase that, um, Jesus Christ had the wrath of God poured on him so that we would not have to face the wrath of God, and then we would be able to get into heaven and have eternal life. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just a ticket for getting into heaven, nor is it about following the right way. The gospel of Jesus Christ would not be good news if it did not affect us now. It would not be good news if it did not affect the original audience in their situation. Jesus Christ, so far in the Gospel of Mark, has healed lepers. He has healed Peter's mother-in-law. 
He has calmed storms. He has casted out a legion of demons. He has raised a young girl from the dead. And in the pages of Mark's gospel, you see Jesus, who has the authority to forgive sins before his crucifixion. Mark's gospel does not place emphasis on the crucifixion as a forgiveness of sins, or I guess I should say individual acts of wrongdoing. But rather, he puts emphasis on humanity being liberated into God's service in the crucifixion event. This is the theme of the gospel of Mark as a whole. Jesus Christ continues the work of God in the Old Testament by freeing those who cannot free themselves. In the first sermon of this series, I remarked how the gospel of Mark is known for its extremely fast pace. And I said, if the gospel of Mark slows down, that means to pay attention to what is happening in the text. This means that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the most important event to unfold in the gospel of Mark. It would have been insanely easy to preach an hour-long sermon on this passage. Jesus' crucifixion is predicted in chapter 8, verses 31, in chapter 9, verses 30 through 31, and Mark chapter 10, verses 33 through 34. The following events around the crucifixion slow down dramatically as well. There is special emphasis for the reason why Christ must be crucified. It is spoken about in Mark chapter 10, verses 45. And coming before the crucifixion, we see Jesus at the Last Supper, presenting his blood and body being broken for a new covenant. It is clear within Mark's gospel that the climax of his story occurs at Jesus' death. Mark sets up the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as the most important event to unfold in his gospel. And before Jesus is handed over to those who crucify him, we see him pray in the garden, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. So even at this point in which Jesus is in the garden, in which the shadow of the cross is cast over him, he is praying to complete the will of God. At this point in the text is evident that God is not working against Jesus. Rather, Jesus is working to complete the will of God. To put into perspective, to show that God is indeed working alongside Jesus, we need to return to the beginning of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is a completely, a carefully written document, meaning something as minute as a verse in the first chapter can help us understand the events of the crucifixion. In the events of Jesus' baptism, in chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, a particular word is being used by Mark as Jesus' baptism. And that word is schizo. I want you guys to say it with me. Say schizo. If that word sounds familiar to you, um, think of the word schism. It means something like torn apart. And if you guys are familiar with the beginning of Mark's gospel, with Jesus' baptism, that word is being used to talk about how the sky is ripped open and we hear the voice of God proclaiming over Jesus that he is his beloved son. And likewise, in chapter 15, verse 38, the same word is being used to describe the events in which the kerchen and the tipple is torn from top to bottom. And something remarkable about this point is that each time the word schizo is being used, there's a proclamation in which Jesus is called the Son of God. Sandwiched in between these two uses of this word, the story of how God is working through Jesus Christ in his life and even on the cross. 
So the fact that those two words are used at the beginning and at the end of Jesus' ministry proves that Jesus and God are working together with the events of the cross. I think I made the point clear that I'm trying to make that Jesus and God are working together. Within the Christian tradition, there are numerous ways to understand the crucifixion. And when we come to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, it becomes so difficult to be understand what each gospel writer has set out to do. Our understanding of the gospel can sometimes get in the way of what the gospels are trying to say. But the purpose of Jesus' crucifixion is intimately involved with the good news that I preached on last week. In a strange way, the glory of God is shown during the crucifixion event. There is a reason why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. It's just not the way that one would get power yesterday, and it surely isn't the way that one would get power today. You know, when we think of the way of obtaining power today, we think about the elevation of self. We look at ways how we can be better in terms of getting the next big job promotion, driving the coolest car, or getting the newest and latest gadget. However, we see in the Gospel of Mark a tale of two kingdoms. Jesus Christ gives the reason why he came in Mark chapter 10, verses 45. And it's different than the way we, how we live our lives. It is written that, for even the Son of Man came not to serve, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The verb ransom points to the actions of God during the crucifixion, and as well the actions of Jesus in the gospel. Jesus Christ's goal is to redeem people and his primary way he does that is according to the will of God and by the means of the cross. The goal of Jesus Christ as giving his life as a ransom for many is to create a new people around himself. And you, my friends, are invited to that new community that Jesus creates by means of the cross. We see this to be true throughout the entirety of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus Christ casts out demons out of the Gerasene demoniac, and the healed man is told to go spread the news of Jesus. Jesus heals a bleeding woman and raises a young girl from the dead. They are once cast out from the community, but because of Jesus, they are welcomed back into the community and as well to the kingdom of God. In Jesus Christ, God is rescuing and redeeming his people so that we can be faithful to the will of God. Through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we have been liberated from the powers of sin and death. There's no specific mention of Jesus Christ dying for our individual sins. But through the cross of Jesus Christ, we are freed from all powers that oppose God's will so that we can be like Jesus. With Jesus offering his life as a ransom for many on the cross, he is faithful to the will of God when we were unable to. By his actions on the cross, we are invited to live faithfully. Jesus Christ offers an example for us on how to live, and it is opposite of how our earthly kingdom operates. Jesus Christ obtains power through the cross. Jesus Christ receives and gives power to the kingdom of God by walking with those who are oppressed, who are ill-stricken, and who are suffering. 
and he releases them into the service for the kingdom of God. In short, Jesus Christ distributes the power to be able to live like him. And that is good news for us. The question that this poses for us is, how should we live in light of the example of Jesus Christ? How will we, how will we give out our own privilege in order to help the marginalized? Regardless of who you are or what you do, there is some way in which you can follow suit of Jesus. To enter into the mission of God in order to get true power is not through obtaining wealth or riches, but is by laying down your own preferences in order to make others whole. To follow the example of Jesus Christ is an extremely difficult task to do. It is daunting, it is intimidating. But we have peace in the fact that Jesus Christ has come and that he has participated in the human experience and he has shown us to the way of life abundant. This whole week, I struggled what it means for us today to talk about what it means that Jesus Christ was crucified. The story of the crucifixion is a horrible and wretched story in which humanity took the one perfect man and subjected him to cruel punishment. But there is something to say about a God who desires to be with us. And through that desire, he had faced the worst of the worst. And there is no doubt that some of you guys in here have faced the worst of the worst. Sometimes I wonder if there will ever be anyone who understands my pain and my grief. But through the crucifixion, we see Jesus, the Son of God, embracing full solidarity with us. He understands our sorrow. He understands our pain. And he is no stranger to our pain because he experienced it on the cross. He walks alongside you. And you can bring all your burdens to Christ. Cast all your fears and anxiety on him, for he cares for you. This is an account of the victory of God, that Jesus Christ has come, and he has overcome all things on our behalf. He has overcome the indifference, our indifference to fulfilling the will of God. We should have hope, because he has made void the grip of sin and death, and he gives us a new promise of entering into a new relationship with God. He invites us to live like him.